Well, I hope you're all enjoying version 3 right now. It seems everybody loved the last video, and one of the things that I noticed after I had produced that video was that I left out a couple of things that were new in version 3. So we'll consider this version 3 new features part 2. Let's do this. Hi, and welcome to episode 55 of Understanding Darktable. Like I said, there were a couple of things I overlooked, and the reason I overlooked them, or the way I came to overlook them, was the fact that the documentation that I was using as a roadmap for episode 54 was not a complete list. And what's kind of frustrating was after I'd edited and uploaded that episode, I realized, oh, there were all these other things that I was going to talk about, and they because they weren't mentioned in that particular documentation, I completely overlooked them. So we're going to get to that in this episode. One thing I do want to mention before I get started, the last episode I was still using Release Candidate 2, and as of today, which is the 27th of December, the Linux Mint, which is the distro that I run, repository does not yet have Darktable 3. They haven't updated yet, and I kind of figured that was going to happen. So I've gone and compiled Darktable from source code. So as you can see in the top left-hand corner, I'm on version 3.1.0, blah, 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 blah. Don't stress, if you are running an official release of 3.0, I don't think there's going to be anything different at this stage in the version that I'm running against what an official 3.0 release would look like, to the best of my knowledge. Okay, with that said, let's get into this. The first thing is dynamic keyboard shortcuts, which can be assigned to the sliders within any particular module which then allow you to adjust that control without actually summoning the module, which I think is pretty cool. So if we go to our little gear icon up here and we go to shortcuts and go to image operations, we've got a list of all of our modules. The example they use in the documentation is mapping the exposure control. So in this sense, this first level that says exposure refers to the module. This next instance of the word exposure refers to the exposure slider within the exposure module. And then within that, you'll see there is a dynamic option, and I have already mapped it to the letter E. So what that means, and by the way, if you wanted to work out how to do this, you just double click on whatever control it is, and then type the key that you want. So we'll go E, it says this is already, already mapped to dynamic. Do you want to overwrite it? We'll go yes. So now we'll go double click on dynamic, type E, yes, we want to overwrite it. And now it's set back to that particular parameter. Now we click on close. So what this means now, is that I can hold down my E key and using my mouse wheel, I can now adjust exposure without having brought the exposure module to focus on the right hand side of the darkroom interface. That's pretty cool. So if I want to increase exposure, it's simply hold down my E key and roll my mouse wheel away from me and I can adjust the exposure like so. And like I said, you can do that for most slider controls within any of the modules in the darkroom view. I think that's pretty cool. Next up, the color picker. In the tone curve module, the color zones module, and the fill light module, as well as inside the parametric masking, now allows you to select an area rather than just a point. Why do I get the feeling I did cover this in app 54? Okay, it doesn't matter. Even if I did, I'm just going to cover it again. Okay, so if we go to our tone curve module and we decide to use the color picker, by default, this will work on a point value. So 
if I click on an area of her shirt here, we will see a single line denoting the value of the luminosity at that particular point in the image. But we can now click out of that and go control click and have an area that can be sampled. And as you can see, this is quite a large sampling at the moment. It's covering this quite large portion of the middle of the image and it covers all of that range of the histogram that is bounded by that pink box over the module. If we select a smaller area like so, let's say a big patch of her skin there, we will see that that covers a slightly narrower range but a lot more than just a point source. And like I said, this works in tone curves, fill light, and the color zones module. But this also works in parametric masking as well. So let's turn this off, scroll down, turn on parametric masking. Now we've got our old style color picker here, which we can activate and it will just give us a point on the image and whatever value is represented at that point will be indicated by these little white lines on both the input and output uh, color bars in the parametric masking section. We can turn that off. We can then control click this to select an area of pixels. And what this does is give us still the little white lines, but also, and it's quite hard to see on my monitor, I don't know if it's easier to see on yours, but there is a, not high, well, kind of a highlighted range of pixels either side of that white indicator bar, which shows you the range of hues, in this case, because I'm using H for hue, uh, that have been picked up inside that area. Now, you're probably thinking, but I want to adjust the input values based on that area. Don't worry, we can do that. Let's get out of that and click the next icon because this one will allow us to select a range of pixels and it will adjust the input values for us based on that area. So if I now drag across her shirt, it will remap to the range of reds at this end plus the range of reds at that end. Uh, let's do a po portion of her skin. You can see it's adjusted the input values again. Pretty cool. Now that, by default, using a single left click on that icon, will use whatever area you select to determine input values. You can make it do output values, just reset that by double click by control clicking this icon and now it will use that area to set the output range so it's pretty cool i like it so if we now select greens it's remapped our output values to that range of green pixels there is a new preference which will allow a module to expand or collapse when it is activated or deactivated. Now this is not the same as the option expand a single light table module at a time or expand a single dark room module at a time. It is this next option. Expand the module when it is activated and collapse it when disabled. So if we enable this particular option, if I was to come into the tone curve and I do something with the tone curve. Let's say I wanted to do that. If I deactivate the module, the module automatically collapses. I love that. If we turn it back on, it automatically expands the module as well. If I didn't have that checkbox ticked, then we could turn that module on and off and the module itself does not expand or collapse it simply remains unresponsive it turns the module on and off but it doesn't change the visibility of the module itself so i think 
for me personally, I'm going to have that turned on because I like the idea of it actually collapsing the module if I deactivate that module or expanding the module if I reactivate that module. There is another new option inside preferences to have the collect images module work via a single click rather than what has up until now always required a double click. I love this. So in the light table section of the preferences, you will see use single click in the collect panel. So when we go into the collect images panel in the light table view, we can now use a single click to move around through various options there. Now I have just made a little bit of a discovery whilst I was recording this, and that is that if I go to any one of my predefined collections, it will put the date range for that collection, which was the modifier that I used to create that collection was simply a date range. So only the images which match that particular collection are displayed. However, the tree here is still showing me every year of photos that makes up my entire collection. I'm not sure if this is a bit of a, a bug that still needs to be addressed or if it's something else, but I do notice that if I reset the module and I go and create a date range and I do something like 2019-01-01 through to 2019-02-28. So I just want everything from January and February, for example. Click OK. I've now got just those images, but I'm not seeing all other images in my collection. And that's how I would expect it to be. So maybe it's simply related to the fact that my collections were created in an older version of Darktable. Not entirely sure. Doesn't seem to be affecting the ability for Darktable to create that collection, but I did just find it weird that, you know, if I pull up any one of these collections, it's also showing me all of these other years of images which are not related to that collection. Might be a bug. Anyway, moving on. Okay, another new feature is the introduction of an arrowhead on the gradient mask feature. So let's suppose, for example, I wanted to darken the top half of this image because I just want the viewer to focus on the flowers. And let's suppose I was going to use a tone curve, for example. I would then go into Drawn Mask. And if I choose the gradient tool, you will see that the gradient tool now has this arrowhead on it, which it never used to have. And that shows you the direction in which the mask operates. So I can still grab the control handle to rotate it. And I can use my, use my mouse wheel to extend or compress the gradient and the central node to reposition where the mask falls over my image. Yeah, so just the introduction of that arrowhead to show you which direction the gradient is traveling in, just to help you orient the direction of the gradient on your image. Another new feature, three modules, specifically split tone, graduated density, and the watermark module have all had color pickers added to them, which previously did not exist. So for example, if we go to the split toning module, we now have these two color pickers for the shadow and highlights color swatches. And you can use those to select an area of your image to use as the color for the highlight or shadow of the split tone. So simple left click and pick an area. We might say, love that brickwork. So that's chosen that color for the shadows region of the split toning module. Uh, graduated density, let's find you. Also now has a color picker here. 
So if we wanted to choose the reds from the rows here, we can now do that and it's chosen that hue and you can then adjust the saturation according to what you want. Likewise, the watermark module now has a color picker to the right of the color picker bar. You'll also notice that if you ever use a color picker within any module, the position within the image that you have taken the eyedropper sampling point from will remain sticky throughout your editing operations within that particular module. So if we were to go to split toning and we use that dropper tool to select our color swatch, any editing you do within that particular module, that color sampled point will remain sticky until such times as you choose a new point. Next up, in the map view, and I do realize this is an area that I haven't really delved deeply into in this series of videos yet, but I think I've covered it briefly. You can basically activate your film strip, you can grab a bunch of images and you can drag them onto the map and this will add GPS coordinate metadata just to the XMP file. It doesn't adjust the raw file or the JPEG, it just simply writes the location data into the XMP and you can include that metadata on export from Darktable if you so choose. One thing that has been added now though in version 3 of Darktable is that if you have added your images to the map, i.e. given them GPS coordinate location metadata, and you jump to a particular saved collection, if the images in that collection have that GPS information, then the map will automatically jump for you to show you those images. Why it doesn't center it, I hear you ask? That is because in this particular collection of images, Sri Lanka and the Maldives, I had a couple of images that were taken in Singapore. And interestingly, they are not showing up there. But if I zoom in, we can see them there. That's why that zoomed view wasn't just centered on Sri Lanka. It was because there were some images from Singapore as well. Uh, let me demonstrate another one. If I go Capiti Valley, that was the ride that James and I did earlier in the year. And again, it seems to have missed the mark a little bit, but it's basically repositioned the map to somewhere close to where this collection of images was shot. Something else that's been introduced is the ability to change the time in the slideshow view. So scroll down in preferences to the miscellaneous section, waiting time between each picture in slideshow. So you can now change the number of seconds between each image in slideshow mode. Another key introduction that I failed to mention in the last episode is on conflict in the export selected module. Up until now, we've simply had create unique file name and overwrite. We now have a third option, skip. This is a great new feature as far as I'm concerned. So if you've selected a batch of images and you want to export them to a particular folder, but you've already exported some of those images before, you're not forced into either overwriting the previous version or creating a new version with an appended number, you can now choose to simply skip those images because you might already be happy with the versions you've exported. And the last one, I've got to confess, I'm struggling to understand. According to the documentation, the retouch module now has the ability to allow you after a shape has been created to change what mode that particular shape is operating in, whether it's a heel or a clone or a color or a blur. But I will confess I've not been able to make any sense of this alleged change. So if someone can explain that in the comments down below, please do because I'm keen to understand it for myself. But anyway, 
that hopefully is a complete wrap up of all of the new features and modifications in Dark Table 3. Thank you for your understanding. Yes, I probably was guilty of just trying to get episode 54 out the door as soon as version 3 dropped, and my bad for uh, letting a few things slip through the cracks. Okay, I am going to maintain my long-held mantra, philosophy, call it what you will, of not wandering off the topic during my videos. I've been accused of doing that. I thought I was pretty good at staying on topic, but uh, I will remain vigilant in my efforts not to do that going forward. If I have things that don't relate to the topic at hand that I want to tell you about, like this, I will leave them till the end of the video so that you get what you came to find as early in the video as possible. Uh, I will confess that there are some content creators on YouTube who absolutely drive me to distraction with the amount of fluff that you have to get through before you actually get to why you came to watch the video in the first place. And I have always tried not to fall into that trap and I will continue to do so. I don't care about watched minutes or how long people are watching my content for. I want you to be able to find what you came to find as quickly as possible. Um, so anyway, that's just me on my soapbox. Apologies. All right, Christmas has been and gone. New Year is just around the corner as I'm recording this. So I will take this opportunity to wish you a happy new year or hope you had a happy new year and that 2020 brings you everything you are hoping it will. To my Patreon supporters, I want to say thank you again for your continued support. That thing we were talking about, yeah, let's make that happen. You guys, you've got my email address, so flick me an image and I'll get on to that. All right, I will catch you in the next one.